Romans 4, 18. Can I read it in the King James Version? Uh -huh. it, it, it says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. I like that right there. I like it because it means I still have hope. Look at somebody and tell them I still have hope. Come on, go and declare it and decree it to somebody else. Tell them I, I still have hope. Come on, as you take your seat, confess it. I still have hope. Take your seat out. I still have hope. Now, come on. Not everything is perfect, but I still have hope. Come on. Been through some things, but I still have hope. Matter of fact, I'm going through something right about right now, but, but I still have hope. My, my money ain't all together, but I, but I still have hope. My, my heart might be hurting. I know I'm smiling, but that's because I still have hope. Uh, anybody in here still have hope? You're going through things are crazy. You got to declare it and decree it even when you don't feel it because a positive confession will bring it. Somebody say, I still have hope. I, I confess I have hope. I, I decree I have hope. I declare I have hope. I know I got hope. Hope is on the way. Hope is in me. I'm, I'm hoping myself to a new life. I, I'm hoping myself to abundance. Somebody holler, I got hope. I got hope. I got hope. I got hope. Somebody say, I got hope. I got hope. Why do I say we got to confess that you have hope? Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And one of the greatest tools uh, that the enemy employs are the spirits of defeat, despair, and discouragement. Come on. Because the enemy knows that if he can adequately discourage you, Regardless of all of the gifts and the abilities that God has put in you, that discouragement will keep you from fulfilling what God has ordained for you. So the enemy specializes in getting us to view almost every situation as a hopeless situation. Tell somebody he's telling the truth now. Come on, he'll use the morning and the nightly news. He'll use Facebook, he'll use Twitter, he'll use Instagram, he'll use a tragic event. He'll use your inability to pay your mortgage and your rent. He'll, he'll use discouragement. He will, he will use your own mistakes. He'll use your history. He'll use your failures. He'll, he'll use distress, grief. Disease, devastation. He'll use discord to upset your emotional equilibrium. But you need to tell your neighbor the devil is a liar. I done come too far to turn back now. That joker should have killed me when he had me depressed. But I can see clearly now the sun is shining. And, and tomorrow is about to be a new day. Somebody holler, I got hope. I got hope. See, the enemy is trying to get you to confess what's the use. The enemy is trying to get you to confess, I, I never make it. I, I don't see how it's going to happen. I've done all that I can do, but you need to hear me up in here. The enemy might try to make you want to holler and throw up both your hands. But since you got your hands up in the air, you might as well give the God of hope some praise. Because it's next level time. So somebody holler, it's next level time. All the way in the balcony, holler, it's next level time. I got hope that is. Tell somebody, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Because hope will make you get up when you don't feel like giving up. Come on, hope will make you go to the next level when you think this is the only level. 
That's why, that's why good old Paul in this, in this fourth chapter of Romans, he's talking to all of the beloved in Rome, those who love Jesus, those who love Jesus in Matheson, who love Jesus in South Carolina, who love Jesus in Cleveland. Here in this fourth chapter of Romans, he uses Abraham, the father of the faith, to help us hold on to our faith. Grab your neighbor's hand and squeeze it and tell him, hold on now, hold on, hold on to your faith and hold on to your hope. Hold on to your hope. Don't let your hope go. Hold on to your hope. Hold on. If you don't hold on to nothing else, hold on to your hope. Now, now let's just have a, a few brief definitions. Uh, uh, hope, a classical definition of hope, is a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing. Is anybody expecting God to do something in your life? Come, come on, holla, I'm expecting, I'm expecting. Synonyms like desire, want, expectation, and anticipation, uh, they help us with hope. From a biblical perspective, when you talk about hope, you tack on trust, to trust, to wait for, to look for. I'm looking for a miracle. I'm expecting the impossible. I'm believing it, I'm gonna receive it, and I can give him praise for it today before it even shows up. Somebody say, I'm looking for it, I'm looking for it. Uh, but when addressing God, the prophet Jeremiah said something like, our hope is in you, O God. He said, the Lord is the hope of Israel. I believe that that's the lenses through which old Paul was looking when he penned these words in verse 18. Look at it again in Romans 8, 4, 18. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, against all hope, against all hope, against all all hope. First of all, if we are to live a life of hope, we must understand that when there is a need for hope, the odds will almost always be against you. Inevitably, something in our lives will have created the need for hope. Have you ever had something happen in your life where it created a need for hope? Anybody ever said, I sure hope, I hope I pass this exam. I sure hope surgery goes well. I, I, I hope I can pay these bills. I, I, I hope I get this job. Lord, I hope I can keep this job. You know, you know I need this job. God, I hope my child gets a scholarship. I, I hope I can pay these loans off. God, I hope they don't foreclose on my home. Good, good God. Anybody ever here holler to God? God I, I, I hope something happens, the new that happens. And see, hope is what happens when the outlook is bleak. When there's nothing else you can do. When, when, you, when, when what you're working with ain't enough to work with. You ever been to the end of the month and you ain't have enough to work with because you need to be working? Somebody ought to holler, God, you got to work some stuff out up in here. <laughs> Somebody holler, work it out, God, work it out, work it out. I've got to focus and stay focused on the right object of my hope. Tell your neighbor, don't be looking around at everything. It'll mess you up. Don't, don't, you got you to gotta focus on the right thing for your hope. Come on. Paul was saying uh, of Abraham against every earthly reason to hope he hoped uh, he hoped and 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 in hope he believed to believe is to accept as true to have confidence in the truth or the reliability of something that exists in the face of a hopeless reality abraham uh, said i still believe I, I don't believe in some nebulous vague concept of hope. This ain't a pie in the sky type of thing. No, I believe in God. God is the God of my hope. And, and I say that, that he had to focus on God because against all hope, every, everything looked like there ain't no reason to even see it. Some of y'all going through some stuff right now that it, it seems hopeless. You didn't gave up on that thing. But God says, don't look at the thing. He says, I want you to hope against hope. Hope against the reason 
for, for things to get better and believe in the God who knows how to make things better. See, 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 the only reason that Abraham could hope like that is even though they talked about him in the beginning of the book, he knew enough about God to hope in him in spite. So you don't have to be saved for a long time. You can know one thing about God and it takes you to the next level if you work what you're working with. See, see well, uh, turn over to Genesis 12. And stay in, in Genesis 12, we're going to walk in Genesis a little bit. The uh, first thing that old Abraham knew is that God was a personal God. Somebody say God is personal. Again, he's personal. Genesis 12, verse 1, it says that the Lord had said to Abram. Somebody say the Lord said to Abram. Uh, Abraham knew that God was a personal God. Because God spoke to him personally. God ever said something to you, ever spoke in your spirit. He's a, aren't you glad he's a personal God? Somebody say he's a personal God. Abraham also knew that God was a covenant-making God. A covenant God. Look at Genesis 12. It says, it says, it says, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. And go to the land I'm going to show you. He says, if you do that, I will make you into a great nation. Boy, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. They might not know you now, but everybody going to know you when I get done with you. In other words, he knew that God was a covenant God because he did what God said. Amen? See, Abraham knew that God was the God of divine protection. How many of y'all know God is a God of divine protection? Look over at Genesis 15, around verse 1. It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Said, do not be afraid, Abram. Why? Because I am your shield. Your very great reward. The King James says, thy exceeding great reward. How many of y'all know that God has your front? He has your back. He's got you above and he's got you beneath. Somebody ought to give God praise because he's your shield and your exceeding great reward. He knew that God was the God of divine direction. Look at chapter 15 of Genesis verse 7. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. The God of divine direction. Anybody know God's the God of divine direction? Come on, he brought you out of the hood into a new neighborhood. You ought to give him praise. He's a God. Come on, brought you out of the country into the big city. Brought you out of poverty into prosperity. He's the God of divine direction. And you know that he knew that God was the God of divine creation. How many of y'all know that God is the God of divine creation? Come on. We, he, he didn't even have a Bible. But we got the Old and the New Testament. And because we got the Old and the New Testament, we sure enough know that God is the God who created everything. How many of you know he's the God that created everything? How many of you know he's the God of the in the beginning God? How many of you know he's the let there be God? How many of you know God can speak it and it comes to pass God? Somebody ought to give it. How many of y'all know he's the I am? That I am God. That means he's the pre-existing, self-sustaining, everlasting God. How many of y'all know him as Jehovah God? How many of you know he's Jehovah Jireh? Y'all forgive him some praise. Huh? How many of you know he's Jehovah Rapha? He's the Lord God that heals thee. How many of you know he's Jehovah Nisi? He waves the victory banner before the fight is even. Well, how many of you know he's the Alpha and the Omega? He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the ancient of days. He's the lover of our soul. Somebody ought to give him praise because you know who your God is. Come on, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he can do everything, and nothing is impossible with your God. So if you're facing an impossible situation, you ought to focus your hope on your God who says nothing is impossible for those who believe. Give God some glory up in him. Doesn't matter, nothing's impossible, nothing's impossible. If he's the God of your salvation, baby, you got to focus your hope on that God right there. Somebody holler, I'm focused. And if he's the God of your salvation, secondly, you have to focus your hope 
upon what your God says. Somebody holler what he says. That was the position of Abraham. Uh, he placed his hope in what God said. Because what he says is central to the manifestation of what you're hoping for. You can say it and hope it, but if he says it, you can rest assured that it's, oh, y'all. Come on, look at verse 18 again. Verse 18 of Romans 4. It says, so Abraham be became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. God said, so shall your offspring be. God said it, and when God says it, you need to get ready for it because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Ask your neighbor, what has God said to you? Come on, ask them, look them in their face. What did God say? What has God spoken over your life? What has God decreed? in your life. If God said that thing, uh, oh, y'all need to hear me. Come on. Abraham became the father of many nations. Let me help you. He became just as it was said. Abraham became just as God said. Abraham's daughter became just as God said. Uh, Abraham became because God said. Come on. God says of himself in Isaiah 55, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and does not return to it without watering the earth, he says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Y'all ain't hear me up in here. God said, if I say it out of my mouth, it's got to prosper because I said it can't return void. Oh, oh y'all need to hear me. I try to be a daddy of my word. When I tell my children something, I want them to be able to depend on their daddy's word. So when I say, mama's not gonna pick you up today, daddy will be there at 7.30. I don't need my kids standing out there, the last kid being picked up at eight o'clock trying to figure out, is daddy coming around? Oh, y'all ain't hear me. If I say they gonna get it, everything in my power is gonna make sure that they get, y'all don't hear me. Uh, why? Because I don't want to dash their hopes. I don't want them to say that my word is null and void. Now if me and my crazy self can try to be a good daddy, what do you think about your Abba Father? When your Abba Father says that it's about to come to pass, Baby, you need to start packing up your boxes. You need to open up the door. You need to put your car on idle because you're about to go to another level. Somebody ought to holler, say it, Daddy, say it, Daddy. Because if Daddy says it, he knows the plans he has for you. Plans to prosper you. Tell somebody, Daddy speaking, Daddy speaking, Daddy speaking. God said, when I say it, it can't return, boy. I don't care what they say or what did I say. What is God saying? Going back over to Genesis 15. What did he say? What did he say? What did he say? What did he say? Genesis 15. What did he say? What did he say? Genesis 15. What did he say? What did he say? 15.4. He says, then the word of the Lord came to Abraham. This man will not be your heir. He's speaking of a servant that was in Abraham's house that if you didn't have a son, your heir would have your inheritance. He says, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. 
God took the boy outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. In other words, he said, if I say, don't put a limit on what I'm about to do for you. Why you keep putting a limit on what I said I was going to do for you? I don't care that it looks dead. I, I'm the God who watches over his word to perform it. Y'all don't hear me. I don't just put it out there and not steward it to make sure that it does exactly what oh, y'all ain't hear me. God speaks his word and then God takes his mighty right hand and navigates that word so that that word does what he says it's going to do and the harvest of return that he expected for that seed has to come to oh y'all get to hear me up in here God said that he watches over his word to perform it God said so shall your offspring be so it was up to God to God to perform it the manifestation of what we hope for requires that we first focus our hope in the God of our salvation. Secondly, that we focus our hope on what he says. Third, you have to focus, uh, focus your hope in spite of what you say. Tell your neighbor, stop looking at what you're looking at. Hope perseveres in spite of what we see. I know it looks stank, but God says a sweet aroma about to come out of that thing. If, if you stop looking at it and look at me and what I say, he says, I can speak those. Say, hey, come on, anybody here got some personal challenges? Just tell the truth. Look down your row. Tell you, you too, oh, you too. Anybody got some personal stuff? Getting on your last nerve. Your reserve nerve, your dangling reserve nerve. Come on, tell your neighbor, stop letting it have your attention. Stop looking at that thing. Stop talking about that. They get on my nerve. They make me shut up. Stop talking about them. They getting on my nerve. I can't stand them. I ain't gonna never happen for me. How they get married? Don't worry about them. Verse 19, going back to Romans 4. Romans 4, 19. I like y'all, y'all grown. It says, verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about a hundred and Sarah's womb was dead. It says without weakening in his faith, he hoped in spite of the facts. Look at him, I say, I know the facts. Hope faces the facts, but sees by faith. Ain't that what faith is? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. You don't hear me. I see what I see, but I don't see what's coming. Y'all don't hear me. I see that thing, but I'm seeing beyond what I'm seeing. Because what I see ain't what God sees. Y'all don't hear me. I see that, but God sees, and I need God's supernatural vision. Oh, faith is hope for the unseen in spite of the evidence. Don't deny the facts, though. Tell your neighbor, you don't have to deny the facts. See, we have to be careful as the sanctified of God. Because often we get into what I call sanctified denial. We, we, we put our heads in the sand and act like what is ain't is. I mean, you can't put your head in the sand. You need to hear me. Because we say real spiritual things that sound real good and spiritual. Uh, or we say, I don't receive that. I ain't claiming that. I don't care what they said. I'm not claiming that. God is colorblind. God ain't colorblind. God is omniscient. He has an appreciation for his diversity that we don't have. Y'all need to, I, and I know what people mean. I know what they mean. They're trying to be all spiritual. And yes, you should rebuke negativity when the enemy tries to throw it at you. But sometimes, baby, it is what it is. If it walk like a duck, quack like a duck, y'all need to hear me about it.